Thank you very much. That was an engaging discussion, which if I had my way, we might be here for another couple of minutes. But we do have some other engaging discussions which we need to involve you in. And a lot of the talk today has been around looking forward, looking ahead, looking to what's next. But I'm sure you're familiar with the term, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. And so one of the things we would like to look at as well is how we learn from the challenges that we've seen in terms of changing work environments and changing employment. Uh, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with um, General Motors and what happened in Oshawa. But there's actually plenty to learn from it and I think plenty of good insights in terms of how we deal with the changing nature of work. And that's going to be the topic of examination uh, for our next panel. I'm delighted to have for this panel as our, uh, as our chair, PPF fellow, um, Dr. Jennifer Robson. She's also an associate professor of political management at Carleton University. And prior to joining Carleton, she held a number of policy and research roles in the nonprofit and public sectors in Canada. She teaches courses on public policy and research methods, and her research addresses social and tax policy, poverty in Canada, and public administration. She's also been the author um, of some of the research work with the Public Policy Forum on a number of issues. Would you please welcome Dr. Jennifer Robson? Afternoon, how's everyone doing after lunch? Um, so this is a case study panel, and I, I'd like to sort of set the stage a little bit for you. So last November, General Motors, as you'll recall, announced several changes to their operations uh, worldwide that were really intended to better orient the company on a plan that it feels will be more sustainable going forward. One of the plants affected, though, is actually quite nearby, about an hour away, which I think by Toronto standards is actually still fairly close, given your traffic. Um, so the, it's the plant in Oshawa that we're talking about where 2,600 line workers plus another 340 salaried or contract workers will be directly affected. And this is on top of another 1,800 workers and local suppliers whose main or only client is actually the GM plant. Last month, GM announced that the plant would be converted into um, a plant create, uh, producing aftermarket parts um, and they hope to be employing at least 300 workers in the region. But looking back to the 1990s, by comparison, there were nearly 15,000 auto workers in the region. So times have definitely changed, and there is no going back to 1996. This is a region that has been a manufacturing hub for generations, but more recently has actually been growing into a bit more of a college town. And that actually turns out some of Canada's best skilled, high, uh, skilled trades and technicians. So we're going to have a panel uh, on stage to talk about what is happening now and where things are headed. Joining me on stage, I'd like to invite Don Lovisa, who is president, Lovisa, uh, who is president of Durham College and chair of Colleges Ontario. Don has overseen the expansion of, among others, the college's investment and research collaboration with local, small, and medium businesses, as well as the creation of a new AI hub. Ms. Tina Ma is operations lead, Canadian Engineering Sites, Engineering Operations, General Motors Canada, where she actually started working in 2014. She holds a degrees in mechanical engineering and business administration. And finally, joining us on stage is Mr. David Peterson. He's Vice President, Corporate and Environmental Affairs, General Motors Canada, where he's part of the company's global public policy and communications team. David has uh, previously worked in senior roles in IT and the financial services sector. So I'll be starting with some brief questions for our panelists, but I encourage you, please, do not wait. Do not be shy. Please use the Slido, and we'll be taking questions from the audience as well. So, thank you very much for making time and being here today. This is a case study, and um, I'm a firm believer that every case study is, whether it's public policy or economics or whatever, it's ultimately about people. So I'm hoping maybe we could start with some of the, the people stories of this. Tina, do you, do you think you could start off for us? Thinking back to when the announcement came down in November, yeah, yeah. what was that experience like? What was it like for you, for your colleagues, friends? Can you walk us through? Yeah, the uh, Oshawa assembly plant, the General Motors Oshawa assembly plant is a huge part of Canadian manufacturing, as you know. So when the announcement hit in November, it was uh, highly spread out on, on news. At the time, I was working as a manufacturing engineer uh, there at the Oshawa assembly plant, so I was there when the announcement uh, hit, uh, you know, right away. I got lots of phone calls, text messages, family and friends who knew I worked at GM, just making sure naturally that I was okay, um, just asking things like, hey, 
what's your plan for the future? What are you going to do? Is it really true what we're hearing? Um, and you know, when the announcement hit, I didn't have answers to those questions. Quite frankly, I don't think we all had all the answers. Um, but uh, there was a, a bit of a phenomenon at the time, I'd say, in the plants, um, where you know, while I was searching for what my next career uh, outlook would be, so was my boss, you know, and so was his boss. And so there was this phenomenon where it became a little bit less about um, you know, what am I going to do and stressing and worrying about um, me and my career path, but a lot about watching out for your brother, watching out for your sister, your coworker who's in the same situation or worse off possibly than you are, right? And there was a lot of shoulder tapping, um, uh, you know, how are you doing? And it didn't matter what department you were in, didn't matter how many years you had spent at the plant, whether it was a worker of yours or whether it was your boss. It was just making sure everyone was OK in the early stages. Um, so obviously, there was a lot of stress um, generated internally, a lot of external pressures as well, just from questions from a lot of angles. But I think that mentality of you know, you know, making sure your partners, your coworkers are OK, it really helped us transition to how we're dealing with things right now. David, maybe I can turn to you because um, I think as Tina was pointing out, this went, the, the workers who were affected went all the way up the food yeah. chain essentially. And I know you're a vice president, but you were also affected. Would you, would you be willing to talk about yeah, your experience? This, this, I, I mean, I had maybe uh, 24 hours advance notice of this. And then the news broke out of Canada. But this was a, a news that uh, GM was going to be um, ending production in eight different auto plants around the world, four in the United States, one in Canada and three elsewhere. So this news was kind of breaking all around the world. And the, the news was a continuation of a very significant restructuring of the company uh, to try and position itself for new technologies in the future. Technologies like electric cars, technologies like autonomous vehicles. And effectively, the overall program was to save $8 billion out of all this restructuring. But it's a really human thing when it hits. So uh, in addition to 2,600 of the very best auto workers in the world, in Oshawa, finding out that, uh, that production would end at the end of this year, by the way. Nothing has changed there yet. It will end at the end of this year. Uh, we were also seeing the company reducing 10% of its salaried workforce and 25% of our executives. So I had to get up and talk in front of the TV cameras for a couple of months, and I didn't know if I would have a job either. Um, none of us did, and it was going to take a period of time to kind of work through this. And so something kind of funny does happen, though, is, is, uh, as uh, contentious and emotional as this was, uh, the community and uh, Canadians sort of just switch a switch and sort of say, OK, well, what can we do? And work started that day in terms of saying, OK, I can't control change. Change is going to happen in the business. This is going to happen, but what can I do? And that set us on a pathway to what ultimately ended up being not the ideal resolution, but a new start for that uh, entire Oshawa operation, which we announced in May. Don, maybe I can uh, turn to you if you don't mind, because I, I, I know, you know, you're at Durham College. You're not directly impacted, but but Durham College has been a you know long-standing engine of turning out auto workers, right? And this was guaranteed employment for a lot of your students, you know, not to mention a huge part of the local community. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience, your impressions as one of those community representatives outside of the, yes, the thank direct you. So family. like others, it was quite a symbolic decision for, for the city of Oshawa, an auto city for 100 years. Durham College has been in that community for 52 years. So uh, obviously we're part of the fabric of that community. So very, very quickly, we also began to hear the impact and the nervousness and the uncertainty and the many, many questions that we all had about what does this mean to the future. We have a couple thousand employees, so obviously we have a lot of GM, GM families at the college too, so we began to hear from our employees and we've been hearing from their stories. So we felt the impact immediately as these people began to think about the future and the impact of these decisions. And, uh, but the nice thing about being in that community for 52 years and working alongside General Motors and, and hundreds of thousands of companies over that years 
is immediately I was able to pick up the phone and call David and, and talk to Travis and say, you know, how can Durham College help you? There's a certain percentage of those workers are going to be looking for some opportunity to retrain, to look for new opportunities, but how can Durham College help you? How can we part, be part of this fabric of the community to step up and to help you? So, you know, like everybody, we waited until the answers came out and we sat down and we, we had many, many discussions about uh, what our role could be in it. And, and our role is teaching and learning. So we have a very, very specific and defined role, but we're part of the puzzle. And if you look at the 50-year history of colleges, colleges were established for labor market change, for labor market uh, expansion. And that's why colleges were established. And in every market that you look at over the 50 years, we've always been part of this. Whether I came out of Thunder Bay, whether you looked at the, the lumber industry that disappeared over that 10-year period and there was nothing to replace it, people came to the colleges. Companies that were expanding came into the college and say, how can we get access to the people who are, who are losing their jobs? So we've always had a role. You go right across this province. Colleges have always had a role in helping companies figure things out, whether expansion, in this case, of course, the closing of the plant and the displacement of many people in our community who are, again, you know, they're, they're um, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives to many of the people who work at the college. So I'm, I'm hearing a story that sort of starts with a huge amount of anxiety, yeah, right? A lot absolutely. of unknowns that are rippling you know, through, up and down in terms of the, the, the employees within the organization, and you know, also out into the community. But I'm also hearing a story about an awful lot of uh, community support and rallying together, right? Employees supporting each other, friends and family reaching out as well, and also collaborations uh, between GM and other members of the community. And so, um, David, I'm wondering if I could come back to you, because of course that adjustment, you've, you mentioned the plant is still, it's still in operation, right? It's in a transition period, I'm sure. Um, and that means that that transition is also being managed by GM. And yeah. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what GM is doing. Well, managed by GM, but we're a unionized workplace. And so we have um, a relationship with Unifor, tremendous union, um, long-standing relationship. You can imagine the shock and the upset on that side. Their job is to defend those workers and to do the very best for them. And they did not shrink from that uh, effort. We heard an awful lot of that. And I respect that and understand that, but um, right from the beginning, we kind of formed a work group um, internally, and much of it, I have to say, started with this guy, um, and the call that he made to me, and he said, you know, um, it's interesting because as much as there is a shock in there, I am getting calls from employers. In fact, quite a few employers. I'm getting calls from, uh, from uh, Ontario Hydro, which has to find 2,000 people to do d the Darlington refurbishment. I'm finding calls from Bombardier. I'm find getting calls, and we were getting these calls too. Um, and so we started thinking, well, what can we do? Okay, this is difficult. Change is going to happen. What can we take back to General Motors and say, here's a, here's a solution. We, we need to work this through with our union, and we, we, we believe we will at some point. So the, the net of where we've ended up in May is that General Motors invested, has said that we'll invest $170 million back into the plant. We will create a new metal fabrication plant, which will start with 300 workers being retained, but then can grow. So every time you build a car, you have to have 10 years of extra parts. We're going to make those parts in Oshawa, not just for General Motors, we'll make them for our competitors. And with Unifor and others, we will build that business. We will go out and sell that business. The difference is that every time you win a new contract, you extend your life 10 years. So it's a stable business that can grow and be steady, unlike the car business where you've got to fight for a new billion dollar investment every five years for a car. So yeah, we'd prefer to have a, a whole vehicle program in there, but if you can't have that because things are changing, what can you have? And then there was two things that, uh, that also came together. Um, we are going through a massive transition at the same time and hiring a thousand people in the software area. So in Markham and in Oshawa, we're developing the code for self-driving cars, which we have on the road in San Francisco today and, and are developing. So we also decided to build a autonomous vehicle test track on the property on 55 acres of the property and that's given us a chance to now grow our engineering business as well and it's together with this metal fabrication area some of the workers there a very limited number of them can work with the test track program so now we have the the, the coming together of this the future and where we've been and, and moving uh, forward 
And there was one third thing that was very important to me. We, have, we happen to be uh, on this incredible property in our headquarters out there. If you drive by Oshawa and you don't stop, you all wonder what goes on south of the 401. Well, you might think it's just a big industrial wasteland. But I'll tell you, when I look out my window, I have 70 air acres of pristine wild uh, life with uh, waterfront property. So we said, we're going to donate that to the city of Oshawa. Um, and what that's allowed Oshawa to do is join the trail system in the east from Darlington Park, right over to the port of Oshawa. And that will be the start of a real estate project we'll do with the city of Oshawa to help develop land. Uh, we'll give them that as their, their park um, program. They can have that for the city and the citizens. And then we'll take a look at other property that we have that will help attract new business into Oshawa as well. So working with the mayor, working with Don, uh, we then said, OK, we're going to need an action center. Uh, what's going to happen uh, is we have, uh, again, uh, these, the workers, uh, half of them are eligible for a defined benefit General Motors um, pension. We'll help bridge those that uh, maybe are a couple of years short of their pension to get that full pension so somebody can retire with three to $4,000 a month for life. They'll get a payout of up to $150,000. They will get a certificate for a new car. And then we decided that we will pay for all the training for any of those employers uh, that uh, if a person can't fit into one of those other jobs, we'll pay for their training to move into new jobs. We'll bring in the employers, and we've created a software system where we know all the skills of our workers. We can match those with 6,000 jobs that have been identified to us in Durham region from these employers, put them together. And when the Action Center starts up in, in August, you walk in. If you're not one of those workers that's going to have a job at General Motors, um, and uh, you, you will then have an action center to support you, and we will help place you. So we've been sort of like a, you know, a job finding uh, facility. We've been working with our partners here. And if they need skills and they need training, Don already has the courses in place to do the training programs for Ontario Power Generation, and so do other colleges there. So this was something we just did as a community. We just pulled together and, and brought this together. Um, and so the, the tick of the tail will be how it works out. But that's what we've tried to pull together as a result. We, my goal is everybody affected will get a new job who wants to work. So if I may just build on uh, two points, one on the Action Centre and where Durham College fits. But, uh, but first, the, the uh, comment about companies coming forward. And they have many, many, many companies that have called the college and said, we're looking for employees. What can you do to help us? And they're not all in the disciplines that people want. And they're not all in the Durham region. But there are jobs there, and there are full-time jobs there. Our job is to, to work with the Action Centre and people who are interested in further education or retraining or even a, a prior learning assessment of the skills and knowledge they have to give them an advanced standing in some of our programs is to do that matchmaking, is to be that conduit for them to, to find their, their path into education and into that job. And right now we have, I think, 44 companies that have come forward saying we're looking for people. The unique thing about the Durham region, and I use that Thunder Bay reference purposely because when industry died in Thunder Bay, there was nothing to replace it because Thunder Bay basically is not growing. In, it's in small towns in Northern Ontario, shrinking. But Oshawa, the Durham region, is growing. There's new industry, there's new businesses, people are looking for people. And even, even OPG, they're looking for hundreds of people within the trades. Not everybody wants to be a tradesperson, but to give you an example, we're training 150 people this year to go into Boilermaker for the Boilermakers Union because they need something like 500 Boilermakers. Well, people who, are, who look at that as a career option, they have the option to do that. And there's many, many examples of that. So it's, it's working with that Action Centre, working with GM, helping those employees who are looking for the college route, the training route, the education route, to, to do something else. We saw that when the truck plant closed too, where people came to us. And people are already coming to us without this Action Centre. And I have to mention TD, because TD Bank actually came forward in our community and said, what can we do to help? And they put money on the table to help add additional um, capacity on our portal for this to not only reach GM employees, but also the second and third tier level employees who are being displaced also, and also to fund a career fair. So we'll bring together industries who are looking for employees and we'll actually have a job career fair sometime in the future. And that's being funded by TD. So people have stepped forward. It is a community. And those relationships we've had for so many years just make this possible. I, I want to ask so many more questions about the details of the Action Centre and the training grant and all the rest of it. But Tina, maybe I can turn to you first and get your response as an employee. So um, 
you know, you're, you're living through this transition. GM is offering certain mm -hmm. supports. There's community supports with the college. Um, how has that experience been as an employee? And I, I think we also want to know what's next for you as well. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I, I think um, the work that our leadership, that the community has put into it, has completely changed the experience of this entire last year since November's announcement. Um, it changed it from what, what could be a, you know, it's just a job loss to now it's a, it's a time to look at other opportunities for myself, right? My, my personal story, I'd love to share it um, just because it's a bit of a living testimony of, of that type of transition um, that we'll be expecting even more so in Oshawa and in Ontario. Um, so I was uh, graduated mechanical engineering, worked for the plant and manufacturing. I thought that was, you know, dream job. That's where I wanted to be. And that's when the news hits. So when you're on a high, that's when the news hits, right? And, and organizational changes happen. Um, but again, you know, instead of just, uh, just a job lost, there was, there was shreds of hope. So there was uh, notes coming out from plant leadership just to, you know, hey, give me your, your summary of your strengths, weaknesses, your career path goals, and we will tailor that and actually look out uh, for jobs for you. Um, in the meantime, you know, my LinkedIn was blowing up. Like you said, employers were really, really looking out for, uh, for people from General Motors, so my LinkedIn inbox was, was really um, maximum. Um, and then maybe a, a month in, I had uh, an interview lined up through my boss uh, for a Canadian Technical Center, still within GM, uh, now in Markham, Ontario. So it wasn't a job that I actively went out to seek. It was a job that came to me from my old employer and basically hooked me up based on my strengths, my weaknesses, and what my career paths were. So I think um, you don't expect that from an employer. You don't expect, you know, when an employer is going through organizational changes, when your boss uh, is on the same boat as you and he doesn't know what he's going to do uh, later on to first look out for you, put his people first, um, and find you the job that matches. And so now I'm working out in Markham. I'm in the Canadian Technical Center. You know, the pace is fast there. Um, work is being output every day. Um, and you know, because of that story and because of the way that my job was transitioned, I, I have a, um, I'd like to give it my all just knowing that that's where it's coming from, right? Thank you You're for welcome. being willing to share that, that personal story. Um, and David, I, I, you know, I can't help but notice you said you wanted to make sure that every worker who wanted to keep working would have a job, so one down already. That's great. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we could come back to the, uh, you know, some of those those details around the, how the action center and how the the funding for training is working and what the collaboration looks like between the organization here, because I suspect there will be other people in the room who might be interested yeah. in thinking about how they can replicate this elsewhere. Well, I think I think the thing that dawned on us quickly is that this announcement was for a change a year out, so we made this uh, last November and uh, the auto plant will run. It's, it's running like crazy right now and uh, producing cars and trucks and will do until December of this year. So you have lead time. How are you going to use that gift of time? And so the idea was if we can, first of all, learn about what job opportunities there are, what supports are there. So the first thing right off the bat, you have psychological help for people immediately in the workplace. Um, really, really important. Um, and uh, we, it, frankly, it took us some time to... Um, to, to settle down to the point where we could get into all the discussions we needed to with, with Unifor. Um, I think, I mean, I have to say that if you are a line worker and you um, are one of the most talented and skilled auto workers and you're 50 years old and you see this kind of job with a defined benefit pension going away, that's a really tough thing. And, um, and so, uh, you know, and we went through an extremely emotional battle. If you were living in Ontario, you probably saw it, and you probably saw too much of me on television, too, with my friend Jerry. Um, but uh, uh, I have enormous respect for Jerry because he's fighting for those workers. And frankly, some of the pressure that was put on us in that was something that I wouldn't resist using to explain to my global corporation that we needed to be able to do some good things here. 
And, uh, and so I'm proud of the package of things that we put together. The, it, the, the proof will be in the pudding. We want to make sure that, uh, that everyone either gets the retirement that they deserve, and maybe we'll help them to that. But even if you're retiring, they will be eligible to go to the job center and get their training signed, lined up and paid if they want to have a next career. Um, and likewise, we have salaried workers that are not covered under a union contract, and we have to take care of them as well. And so we already have more than half of them already replaced in the company because we've had the time to do it. The rest we'll have to do sort of after December uh, when we go forward. But between now and December, if we can line people up with their next career in advance, wouldn't that be a gift? to be able to tell your family where you're going next time. So we're working through that process right now. We know uh, the, half of the employees that are eligible for retirement, um, we've had that canvas, it's done. So now we're down to focusing on the other half and getting the work done, but also planning for their future going forward. We'll do that together with our union. An action center will be run by Unifor. They, there will be people that will be counselors from Unifor working with our workers to help them get counseling and understand what the next role is. And the Ontario government will be part of that uh, as well. We'll work that uh, together with us. And then working with Don, we'll have that ability to match up with, uh, with uh, employers. I think that's kind of an innovation in this. We had the time to do it. And we had the very good fortune to have a robust economy where people said, hey, these are like top quality prize winning employees. And I got a manufacturing business that needs employees. Um, how do I get some of that? And so that's the calls that Don has been getting, and we want to make sure that uh, we join the dots. Don, could I ask you to, to build on what David was saying and just talk more about you know, some of the details around what, what Durham is, is doing in this partnership? Sure. I mean, the Action Centre is, is really the core, but once, once people go through the Action Centre and they decide they want to go to that job, uh, then they're there, and the Action Centre will do the counselling and do some assessment. But then uh, they'll come to the college and say, okay, now this person's been working on the line for 10 years, they have these certificates, and, and come to the college so we can take, then take a look at their prior learning, assess any sort of competencies they might have that we can use for advanced standing, and then steer them in the right training and right program. And the portal that we're providing will also have the employees on this, uh, the employers on this portal will be able to look at what skills they're looking for, so be skills matching there. And like all colleges, and I see some of my college colleagues in here, um, you know, once they become our students, then of course all those supports are there for them too, the emotional support, the academic support for those who haven't been in school for a while, to make sure they're successful too. But, but I can't overemphasize the, the importance of the community. You know, David talked about the emotional support uh, by the Action Center, but there's also a number of organizations that stood that have stood up or in the community to say, you know, these these are devastating times for people when they lose a job like that. They need family support in some cases. Uh, they need they need counseling in some cases, and 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 they may go to the community. So it's really a community approach to trying to ensure that people who are looking for jobs find jobs. People are looking for support to find jobs. People are looking for training and education opportunities to find that. And uh, is it going to be perfect? Absolutely not. But is it going to be our best try? It is. And we're working together to do that for, for all these people that are now displaced and looking for, for something new. So. One, one, of the, one of the things in, in the community that, that uh, through all of the, the campaign and, uh, and all of that, that uh, a lot of businesses suffered in, in Oshawa. Uh, not the happiest place, uh, not the least uh, car dealers. Not pe many people were lining up at the General Motors dealership to buy a new car. Uh, one of the aspects of the, the packages for our employees is a certificate to get a new General Motors car. And, uh, and so that will help uh, spark a lot of economic uh, activity in the area. Um, and uh, in return, our dealers uh, have a program they pay for which is a full apprenticeship program. Who better than a person that built the car to service the car? They have a shortage of technicians right now, and so we have 300 jobs lined up for any line workers that want to now service cars. It's a $100,000 a year uh, uh, job, and uh, it's got different hours and all that, and so it's just an example of how transition can take place. Um, it's just you've got to join the dots. Um, I, I don't know if you guys can put up the slide questions, if there are any from the... Folks with the AV, terrific. Uh, I'm just gonna pick one here. Uh, so here's a question. Looking back, what, if anything, would you have done differently? I mean, I, I realize it's still, this is still a case study in progress. Are there any lessons learned that you'd like to share with the audience? 
Maybe, um, maybe Don, I can start with you, and then David, and then I'll, I'll let you have the last word, Tina. Well, I would say you can always do things differently, and as as we've been developing this uh, this relationship, uh, there are there are things you'd like to change along. You'd like to change looking back, but uh, nothing specifically. I mean, we're at a point where I think that we have a workable model. Uh, if I do anything differently, I turn back the clock and put the plant back together, but that's not possible. But uh, but no, I, I think I think that because of the the efforts and the concern for the employees, that in fact. Um, um, you know, there's ways, to, there's ways to improve it, but I think we're on the right path right now. Yeah. Yeah, I wish the plant didn't close. Uh, uh, we all do. But, um, uh, uh, you know, we learned every day along the way. We made mistakes um, all the way. They're often human mistakes, frankly. Um, you have an extremely emotional situation. Um, you know, we have, uh, I had my children trolled on social media. I had uh, all kinds of things that I would have uh, not preferred to have had happen. But uh, I think that uh, especially in a, in, a, um, in a unionized workplace, communication is always uh, the most important thing. Um, we always could have had more of that. I sure wish we'd had earlier warning on all of this. Uh, but sometimes when um, technology changes and the world changes, it's just going to change. And the question is, when can you start now to focus on what do you do next? And we tried to get to that as quickly as we could. And uh, I, that was my one learning, is get there as fast as you can. Um, Tina, what about you? Are there any lessons learned from your perspective? Well, I think, I think this question cuts deeper than service level, level actually. It's um, one of the biggest thorns when the announcement did come out um, was, well, what could I, in my capacity, have done to change the outcome of this news? Right, and so that's a, it's a big, question, um, and that's not really the answer that we should be searching for. I think it's once you pass that barrier of, you know what, it's not that I didn't uh, do something correctly, I did what I needed to do up until now, and now it's just time to update that resume, time to update that LinkedIn and get myself ready for the next phase in career. Uh, would you please join me in thanking our panelists? This is a case study I think we're all going to be following for some time. Thank you. Thank you.